Hello and welcome to episode 154 of our SAP on Azure video podcast. Today is August 3rd, and together with Robert and Goran, we are here to talk about anything related to SAP and Microsoft. Hello, everyone. Hi. When talking about Azure NetApp files, we mainly talk about this in the context of SAP HANA on Azure. But as we briefly touched earlier as well, ANF also plays a huge role with Oracle workload. So today we want to take another look at updates on Azure NetApp files, what's new with ANF on SAP HANA, and then look at large scale deployments with Oracle on Azure. For this, I'm very happy to have Riyad with us back again on the show. But as always, before we hand over to him, um, let's take a quick look at the news um, from this week. And we actually want to start with an update or with some news on the Azure Center for SAP. Um, Goran, you also found the blog post from Kalyani. Yeah, yeah. so uh, I guess most of the folks are aware about the uh, uh, Azure Microsoft product Azure Center for SAP solution for uh, management and monitoring and, and then um, recently uh, reached the public uh, preview. Uh, it's really very easy. The first step when you do it is to register the stuff, the register the SAP uh, system. You can generally, you would people would use the portal. It's very easy. It's really very easy. However, there is also possibility to do the same and even more thing in PowerShell or CLI. So here is the blog about what if you have really a hundreds of SAP system, how you can automate the whole procedure. And there is a way how to do it. Here is a nice blog from Kalyani, how to do it inside in the, in the PowerShell, define in the CSV file all the needed information and just basically run it. So no need to do a click click on, on a portal, but basically through just a few commands executed in an automated way, which I mean, there are there are customers who are uh, even hosting partners, which might have really a uh, hundreds of SAP system. So a very, very useful blog, um, uh, um, how to onboard, uh, onboard um, many SAP system in um, uh, uh, ACSS tool, yeah. Um, the next very interesting part, we just came in a, um, a private preview. It's it's an Azure Site Recovery support for Azure Shared Disk. So, and they are also supporting Windows failover cluster. Meaning, when I'm uh, when I'm translating to SAP language, that is very high potential to have a, as a scenario for implementing on one hand uh, ASCS in one region um, with a shared disk as a high availability mm -hmm. and using Azure Site Recovery to replicate the whole stuff in another region, meaning also for the DR part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, generally this, this story about um, uh, DR on a cluster central services, both on Linux is really complicated sometimes can be a bit complicated especially about the file share and how to do it and basically i, I really seeing you see they're also mentioning sap ascs and scale out yeah, yeah. um i do see a really a huge potential here to be even maybe at some point of time used for the uh, uh, sub central services instance in an easy okay. way um so basically you have an h in one region easy DR and then also HA in another uh, region as well. I mean, this is not yet and just new. It's not yet tested or certified mm -hmm. for the SAP, but um, let's see, finger crossed. I do cool. see a huge potential here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. No, I agree that that, that would be fantastic yeah. if this really works and is supported. Yeah, nice. Uh, well, it has to be supported, of course, officially, meaning has to be tested, published documentation yeah. for the SAP, but I do. I have a high expectation here. <laughs> Say it here, yeah. Perfect. Right? Thanks, Goran. Customer can always try, of course. They can always try it here by themselves. Okay. Good. Then then moving on. Um you might remember we had Pascal, um Pascal van der Heid um with us um some time back where he talked about um uh, OData um, building a um, React app um, out of this. And now with um, the new support of um, OData for Azure, AP, uh, Azure a um, API management, he updated his blog post 
uh, to now leverage really Azure API management with the new functionalities to call um, all data services directly from the SAP system. And uh, yeah, it, it's just an, an update on his um, repo. And I thought that was actually pretty nice um, leveraging the new Azure API management functionalities. Another um, interesting entry in GitHub, which I, I have to admit I, I didn't knew about was this manufacturing ontologies. And, and to be to be honest, I have never heard about this before, but actually, um, so ontologies define the language used to describe a system and especially for the manufacturing domain, apparently there are these um, reference architectures for ESA 95 to describe a factory ontology and IEC 63278 asset administration shell and stuff like that. So, so there's a lot of content around um, how um, reference architectures for these manufacturers um, um, would look like. And now what they added, or more specifically here, um, what um, Erich, Erich Bahnstedt um, um, contributed now here again to this blog post, is the integration with SAP, like how you can actually um, use this configuration to connect to your on-premise SAP system, how you need to set up the on-premises um, data gateway, how to configure this, how to actually um, connect to IDOCs. So it's a really nice um, addition to this um, yeah, very long uh, article that talks about these um, uh, manufacturing ontologies. Another very popular blog, blog post, so um, you can see it was released just uh, three days ago and it has already over 11,000 views is that the ABAP platform trial is now again available as a Docker container. So, so basically you, you might remember um, the trial 1909 um, was pulled back um, sometime um, and there was a lot of complaint or a lot of um, engagement by the community. And now Carl Kessler, who actually also was on the show some, some time back, um, uh, announced that the ABAP trial is back. And the interesting thing for, for me, look, look at the scroll bar here. Um, if you if you scroll down to the blog post, you can see the blog post is actually fairly short, but all the other things here are um, comments from the community, basically really highlighting how great it is that that it's back and, and and talking about how to install it. So, if you are also one who has been waiting for the ABAP trial um, to return, um, now it's there. Now it's um, available on Docker, and you can just install it on your laptop or obviously um, also on 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 Azure if you like. The last thing that I want to call out today um, is um, announcement by SAP, by the SAP community. And um, you might know there are these SAP champions. I think worldwide there are roughly 80 of these SAP champions. So really a selected group of um, customers, partners, individuals, obviously, that really contribute a lot to the SAP community. And just two weeks ago, um, Martin Pankras, among others, obviously, but um, Martin Pankratz, who has been on the show multiple times, is now also nominated, no, not nominated, he is now an SAP champion, so he's part of the SAP champions program. And Martin, if you're listening, congratulations again. Congratulations. I think yeah. this is really an amazing achievement. Yeah. I'm, I'm really looking forward to, uh, yeah, on the one hand, continuing to working with you, even now if you are an um, official SAP champion. So, so yeah. really, congratulations. M Martin is, is a blog factory, you know, so. <laughs> and, and a high quality <laughs> high block quality factory. blog factory yes <laughs> exactly so it is really fantastic that um sap also recognized this and and really um yeah uh, nominated him or um uh, yeah gave him the sap champion or included him in the sap champion program so really great good with this that was all of the news from um this week which means um we can now hand over to Geert. um Geert, you have been on the show um, also already a, a few times, but still maybe bef before we go into the topic, maybe you can quickly introduce yourself, what you're doing, um, and yeah, and, and then we can get started. Yeah, hey, Holger and uh, Goran, very nice to be back on the show. And actually, frankly, uh, thinking about what you just said, I think I want to want to be a, an SAP champion uh, want to be as well. So let's see how I can get myself wiggled into that program uh, because it sounds very uh, excellent. So uh, congrats to, uh, you know, to the to the new champion out there. It's really, uh, really nice to hear. 
Uh, yeah, now um, I've been on the show before, so probably most of the audience kind of know me, but for the ones that uh, aren't kind of new and tuned into the show recently, um, I'm, um, well, hard to pronounce name, but it's Geert van Teijlingen, uh, product manager for Azure Netter Files, so um, working in the Azure Storage R&D product group. Um, together uh, with uh, with uh, you know my peers at Microsoft uh, to um, build and further extend, if you will, the uh, Azure Net File Storage service that is available. Uh, you know, in actually in GA, we had our birthday celebration. I think uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we're we're you know, we're now in GA for four years, so uh, a, a major milestone. Um, and actually, part of them, you know, let's say us being able to reach that major milestone is actually um, lending SAP workloads, right? Particularly around HANA, and as you mentioned, Oracle as well as a key as a key workload. And then, um, of course, Azure Data Files enables a whole variety of other workloads as well um, uh, throughout the industry and uh, you know throughout the uh, the various uh, uh, workload segments. Um, but uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure, you know, being with you on the show. So um, yeah, uh, let let's uh, get cracking. What Perfect. would you like to know from me? <laughs> so so yeah, exactly. So so last time, or I mean, um, whenever you were on the show, you provided us with a few updates on what's new with ANF, and I think th this is actually really exciting because a lot of things are happening with ANF. So maybe let let's start with um with a quick update on what's yeah, new with ANF, sure, especially yeah, that, in the, in the context of SAP. I know there are a lot of things happening. But obviously, here in our round, we are uh, mainly focusing on SAP. So maybe. Yeah, yeah let's get cracking. So obviously, uh, we're announcing a lot of our stuff, uh, new stuff uh, through Azure Updates uh, and um, the Azure Net of Files What's New page, which is the landing page on our docs area, right? Which you see right here on the screen. Um, and I think um, the last time I was in the show was probably in the October timeframe. So let's kind of uh, rewind, uh, you know, the clock till October and kind of start from there. Um, I think the latest announcement that we then talked about was uh, the, the, uh, the ability for Azure Net of Files to leverage availability zones, right? So the ability to deploy volumes uh, in uh, availability zone of choice. And of course, as as you build HA architectures, that's quite a fundamental uh, functionality um, that we had uh, uh, introduced uh, back in October. So, so if we scroll then, you know, back in time, let, let's go a little bit. Uh, and there's a couple of, as you mentioned, a whole bunch of, um, you know, functionality that we added that are not really relevant to uh, SAP or databases. So I'm going to skip through them. But what you see is going to, there's going to be a long list of functionality, right? So another addition after we uh, added. Uh, availability zone volume placement is cross zone replication, right? So the ability to use the same engine that we use for cross region replication is now available to replicate data across zones. And that is uh, in a variety of scenarios interesting uh, because you can replicate the data independent of uh, your virtual machine infrastructure. And in, in a certain scenarios, it could be very uh, much more cost effective uh, to, to not have to run your virtual machines to do great data replication, but just uh, use uh, the you know, cross zone replication, right? So think about shared files or uh, think about, let's say, uh, DR infrastructures or setup where you want to use uh, zones rather than regions. Uh, that's that's a key uh, key functionality that we've recently added, right? So um, yeah, important addition, a same engine, and we're planning on you know building more on top of that, and you'll also see some more uh, improvements uh, later and, and in the future. Um, then uh, also the uh, the feature of the tool application um, uh, you know application consistent uh, snapshot tool or Easy AC Snap um, was released with version seven, and a good addition there is that. It had the initial support for uh, Azure Net Files backup, right? So the ability to offload snapshots to uh, Azure Net Files backup vaults uh, as part of the the workflow, as well as support for IBM DB2, uh, which is also, of course, mm -hmm. uh, very uh, important in the SAP uh, uh, landscape, right? So that is a great addition, I think, that people should know about. Then, if you scroll a bit uh, a bit further, one. Key enhancement is uh, a little bit on the low end of the capacity spectrum, uh, and that's the ability to create smaller capacity pools, right? So initially, you'd have to deploy four terabytes uh, capacity pools as a starting point, yeah, yeah. and especially environments that are relatively small or you want to start small and grow bigger. Um, there is customers that said, you know, we want to, to basically spend less because we don't need four terabytes. We're good with a smaller capacity, right? So um, that's now available. Uh, and you can still grow incrementally uh, as normal, right? So that is uh, that's a, a key advantage. 
Then customer managed keys, which is in a variety of industries, of course, of importance, right? So we, we always be supported data at rest encryption using platform managed keys from the get-go, from day one. Uh, but we've now added customer managed key support as well with uh, Azure Key Vault um, for key storage, right? So uh, I think that's important uh, from that perspective. Um, then I'm going to skip through a bunch of these because they're not so important for SAP landscapes or, or, or use cases. But one I think I did want to call out is uh, this enhancement of cross-region replication and actually for cross-zone replication as well. And that is the ability to um, revert a snapshot on the source volume while your replication is, is just continues to be active. Previously, you had to kind of break your replication, then revert and then restart your replication, which is obviously not good from an uh, SLO perspective, uh, SLA perspective that you were after. Uh, now you can actually, in, in, you know, in, in a production environment where you need to revert your primary system, just revert that snapshot and you don't have to do any breaking and reconnecting of peering, which is, of course, uh, from an operational standpoint, uh, a major improvement. Um, then there is some support for virtual one. Not, not sure if that's very interesting, although there might be cases where you maybe have some shared file in one region and want to be able to access the shared files from another region and not have to replicate. That's where Azure uh, Virtual WAN support with ANF can uh, can become uh, come in handy uh, because obviously you can then do cross regional access on uh, volumes sitting in one region uh, without having to replicate anywhere. So that's that's uh, probably uh, of interest as well. Um, then we just transitioned to a single file snapshot restore into GA, which is uh, good to know. Uh, you can individually re restore files from snapshot without doing a host-based copy, which is particularly interesting in HANA uh, database restore uh, operations because of the large files that you need to restore. You don't want to restore um, the entire uh, file through uh, the client, or sometimes you don't want to restore the entire volume, but you want to restore an individual file. Uh, with single file snapshot restore, uh, you can just uh, issue a command and uh, the service will just in place restore that file for you without any data copy. And that's also, of course, a massive improvement. Mm -hmm. um, then AZAC Snap 8 came out as well in May 23, um, where there were some uh, some enhancements in terms of um, um, the restore ability, right? The ability to revert volumes through uh, the tool itself uh, is a major improvement from a data recovery perspective. Um, and it, it has some other improvements around uh, manageability of the tool itself. Uh, but I think massive, mainly the uh, the restore capability from the tool itself is, is a drastic improvement. Um, then uh, another feature that we've added is um, on top of the feature that we already introduced a while back, uh, the support for standard network features uh, on new volumes, right? So you could then support NSGs or UDRs and all that good stuff, uh, you know, IP, you know, IP scale from a client connectivity perspective. Um, we had that already a while back, but we are now also able to, let's say, upgrade existing basic network volumes and, and turn them into standard network volumes um, without any data copy. Right, so in cases where uh, where you need some of that functionality, or you need support for global VNet peering, or you need support for um, you know uh, VNet, VLAN, so, uh, you know VLAN connectivity, that's where you need standard network features, and then you can you can upgrade basically your existing volumes uh, through this uh, feature. Um, then uh, an enhancement on customer managed keys in combination with cross region and cross zone replication uh, is a good thing to have. Um, then I think what is also interesting is that we've recently introduced the ability on top of the availability zone volume placement that we already had, the ability to populate existing volumes that you've deployed in the past with the availability zone information. Right? So in the past, when the service did not support availability zones, of course, uh, volumes got deployed somewhere in the region and you didn't really know where. Now you can actually find out where that volume is deployed. And if you like the volume uh, location from a zonal perspective, you can upgrade that volume to, to become zone aware. And then you can apply cross-zone replication or you can build HA on, uh, in another zone based on that uh, functionality, right? So uh, some flexibility in, in terms of uh, uh, that level of support. So that means basically you existing volume, which was not initially deployed as a zone one, you can convert it. I mean, it is in some zone, of course, but it's just not visible. Right. So you can then convert it and that is for the customer visible. OK, that volume which already exists is in that zone and basically it's seen as a zonal one. 
Is correct. That correct? Cool. Yes. Okay. And the customer can choose to do so, right? So if they don't like uh, the zone and it's it happens to be in the wrong zone, then they can just cancel the operation. But if they say, okay, yeah, this is a zone that uh, you know that I actually want, so let's upgrade it, uh, and then it's a zonal, and then you can uh, mm -hmm. apply a zonal uh, cool. replication or HA. Super. If you don't like the zone, you can still make the zone aware and then use cross zone replication to replicate it to another zone and then rebalance your, your location, right? So you can really make more use of uh, zonal functionality that way. Um, and have the service take care of all that, uh, you know, all that ability. Um, and then last uh, one that's mentioned here is a minor one relatively, but actually from an operational perspective, quite interesting. So we have two manual, two QoS capacity pool types, right? So we have auto QoS, we have manual QoS, and when you set up a, a capacity pool, you pick one of them. And they all have their, their own benefits and uh, advantages, right? Um, we already had the ability to change an auto QoS pool to a manual QoS pool, but you couldn't go back. And in some cases, customers say, you know, I don't want to make a change one way and I, and I can't go back. I don't like that. I want to be able to move back or actually want to be uh, started with manual and I want to make it uh, auto. So now we have the ability to also change the, the QoS type back, right? So we can go both ways. And that basically allows you to change the QS type without any data or movement whatsoever between those two types. So that's one. And then last but not least, from a new uh, what's new perspective, we've also recently introduced an addition to Azure NetApp Files, which is a separate uh, dedicated backup vault construct, right? So before uh, Azure NetApp Files backups were basically tied to a volume, which made them a little bit inf bit inflexible from a data restore perspective. Um, and we've now, according to also regular Azure standards, implemented the actual backup vault, right? So you can create your vault, then you assign volume backups to a specific vault, and then <laughs> the volume backups and the, the, the volumes itself come, become independent from one another, which makes uh, future restore operations also a lot uh, more uh, uh, standardized, right? So I wanted to call out that uh, change or that improvement, uh, and, and it really follows other Azure backup standards as well. So oh, that's perfect. kind of the highlights from a much new, uh, I think nice. there was a lot of ground to cover since October. Uh, so yeah, I hope it gave a good oversight, uh, insight at least, overview. Huge, huge oh. improvements, definitely, yeah. Definitely. Perfect, absolutely. And I think um, you, you mentioned quickly one thing that was this four gigabyte limit um, which uh, the, for the capacity tool, which, which actually, is a nice segue because obviously when you when you start when you have an SAP HANA system and now you need to know how do I size my uh, my net of volumes like how should the architecture look like what what um, capacities do I need and I think there you also have a nice um, fairly new tool that allows me to uh, yes. help me size um, my Azure Net Up Files functionalities. That's correct. Yeah, and I think before I go into the tool, I think it's for for context. I think it's important to realize a couple of things as you as you start deploying your Azure Net of Files, um, let's say volumes. Mm -hmm. Then obviously your volumes are hosted in what's called capacity pools, right? A capacity mm -hmm. pool has a tier uh, with and with the tier comes a certain performance level, right? So based on your tier and the volume sizes and the way you assign a quality of service you get a certain amount of capacity and a certain amount of throughput, right? Uh, but basically the, the capacity pool is the, the major hosting construct. And that's also what you get billed on, right? So if you if you deploy capacity pools, yeah. that's what you see on the bill. As you deploy volumes, the volumes itself don't appear on the bill and it doesn't, it's not a billable construct, right? Now what happens a lot is, um, let's say customers kind of start with, uh, with deploying or uh, let's say POC setups and, like you say, they start small. Maybe they want to start with two terabyte, which is now available. Uh, they start with a standard pool, and then as they grow or they go into pilot, they add, right? So they add new volumes, and based on their on their capacity as well as their performance, they decide to create a you know a multitude of of pools, which leads to a couple of problems. One is you can you can if you create multiple pools, you can share the capacity from and the and the performance from a pool between volumes, right? So you all of a sudden get a, get a certain amount of uh, sprawl in terms of uh, capacity pool deployments, uh, and you get overheads, right? So what happens a lot is that people oversize or over deploy uh, based on too many capacity pools uh, and and the wrong type of capacity pools as well, uh, because they don't really predict well enough upfront how they would lay mm -hmm. out uh, you know their volumes across that, right? So that's one. 
Another a misunderstanding that happens a lot is that people think that as they deploy across availability zones, that for each availability zone, you need a separate pool, which is not the case, right? So you can actually create a, a capacity pool, which is a regional construct, and you can share the pool across all the volumes that happen, you know, that are deployed in different zones, right? So what happens a lot is customers have too many pools just because of that, right? So mm -hmm. as you can see, you know, you can start quickly start seeing uh, that's a, a, a massive amount of inefficiency, right? So now in order to uh, alleviate that challenge, um, it is important to understand, let's say, your ideal volume layout. Right, and your ideal volume layout is of course based on uh, sizing, and sizing is, if you don't have the right tools, it's an art almost, and it's complex, <laughs> right? So, uh, and and you know, with artists, you have good artists and you have bad artists, right? So, if you have a good artist, you have you get up with a proper sizing, and your TCO is very efficient. If you're not so, such a good artist, then obviously your your painted landscape doesn't look so good, and it's actually quite expensive, right? So. What we wanted to do is to cre create a tool for the, the world to use to, to for everyone to become a good artist, right? So, uh, and that's the online sizing tool that we have uh, here. And I can share uh, the short link uh, with you for your blog, uh, you know, for your, uh, for yep. your uh, podcast uh, uh, comments later. Um, um, but it's a tool that's on available online, right? And the, uh, the interesting thing is it, it is an, import based tool so it's you have to import your information as uh, you know as you need uh, but you can import your information i mean you can add manually of course but you can also export and import configurations and you can actually share them right so as you go through your sizing exercise you can kind of export and save your configuration for later use you can uh, send it over to somebody else you can uh, share it etc so it's a really uh, a fairly uh, you know, comprehensible tool uh, but it starts with a couple of input fields um, right here at the top, and then based on the inputs that you that you put, uh, you obviously get the results. And the results are broken down in, um, let's say, in the estimated uh, primary storage cost, sizing and cost, basically, or uh, 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 well, deployment layout and cost, um, backup cost, because we do include the uh, advantages of snapshots-based uh, uh, snapshots and backups, because that will really give you a good comprehensive overview of an actual TCO from a storage and data management uh, perspective. It will give you a capacity pool summary and it will also give you options, right? So you can, it will give you options in terms of, is, assume you deploy on standard, this is what you would need. Assume you would deploy on premium, this is what you would need. Assume mm -hmm. you would deploy on Oracle, or, sorry, in, on Ultra, this is what you need. And it will give you the cost uh, difference as well, and it will give you the best recommendation, right? So it gives you that, that choice as well. And at the end, it will give you an actual volume layout summary that you can then use uh, as, you, as you go through your deployment, right? So it's really kind of, you enter your sizing information, and the output is the best the best size recommendation as well as as well as your volume layout, right? So quickly to go through this, and I'll show you real examples as well uh, later on. Uh, but what you need to enter is a couple of things, right? So first of all, you need to, of course define your capacity pools by region, right? So you need to say, you know, for my production, I uh, need a, a capacity pool. Um, and that needs to be hosted in a, a region. And of course, you can pick regions because region pricing is different, right? So obviously, uh, that's been taken into consideration as well. Uh, for some uh, QA system, I need another pool, yeah, uh, yeah. and I uh, I want that uh, you know in, in another type as well, right? So you kind of lay out your your capacity pool uh, options uh, and locations, and also for cross region replication, right? So if you want to do DR to a, a, a cross region replication site, you can also give you that pool and that region. So it kind of get, builds the whole picture uh, and landscape uh, for you. Then it does use, uh, let's say, default performance indicators, right? Obviously, uh, SAP sizing, uh, HANA sizing are based on standardized KPIs, uh, but those standard KPIs are typically built for production workloads. Um, and they're not always relevant, right? So you can actually change uh, the KPIs from uh, you know, from uh, from your standards. For instance, you can say for production, I want 100% of the baseline KPIs that I need to uh, to get this performance. But for my pre-prod, I'm I'm okay with 80%, mm -hmm. and for my QA, I'm okay with 50. Or you know, I can change it to 25%, and the sizing will immediately uh, adjust uh, according to that, right? And obviously, that gives you a lot of advantage because 
if you if you would assume everything to be 100 percent for you know production kpis it will yeah. size performance for workloads that you're not, never going to use uh, and therefore you, you'll be oversized right so you can change all of that and of course the sap experts on the planet which are not because i'm not the champion yet uh, can explain exactly uh, what those different uh, you know percentages are uh, and there's a good uh, documentation that goes with this as well but of course i don't need to uh, need to explain that to the uh, to the to the good uh, sap expert right so that's that and also you can indicate let's say defaults or change the defaults for snapshot and backup right so we mm -hmm. keep uh, they, uh, let's say daily percentage block uh, changes uh, as defaults for the variety of workloads, right? So for your data, for your shared, for a snapshot number of days you want to keep, uh, backup a number of days you want to keep. So you can build out a real um, a setup in terms of, um, you know, data protection uh, uh, policies. And based on those, uh, and based on those real world inputs, it will then also obviously calculate what you need from a storage uh, perspective and how uh, how that can be done efficiently, right? So that's that. So these are kind of the standards. And then you go back into uh, basically defining your HANA system. You, so you add HANA systems, uh, you enter an SID, add a you know, description, you, you define what type of you know, type of system it is, right? Based on your performance identifiers, it will then yeah. use those uh, for its uh, for its calculations. Um, and uh, you know, it, you give the basically the typical uh, parameters that you need for uh, HANA sizing, and you assign the capacity pool, right? And you can also say, you know, this is a single host or multi-host environment, right? So if you want a multi-host environment, it can also take that into consideration. So you add these systems, so you go all one by one, you know, as many as you need in your landscape, QA, Dev, you know, you name it, uh, and then you're done. And as you go, it will then give you the outputs. Right mm -hmm. now, obviously, this doesn't do anything because it didn't enter mm -hmm. anything. Uh, but this is this is how the tool is generally built. Nice. Right? Yeah. All right. So if I go to a real world sizing uh, environment, then uh, I have an example right here um, that is, and I forgot before I showed, I'll talk about it a little bit. It's an HA system uh, in uh, a West Europe region, right? So where production uh, are dual uh, HA uh, into zones. And Preprint was also dual HA in in, uh, in two zones as well. But QA and Dev and um, uh, uh, the other stuff is single zone, right? Sure. Uh, and there is a CRR in uh, set up for production in uh, North Europe, right? So that's kind of the the, you know, the high level uh, landscape. And then based on those uh, you know, various parameters, if we enter those uh, sizings, six terabyte production, uh, six terabyte pre-production, uh, six terabyte quality of service, CQS, um, you know, uh, uh, half a terabyte dev system, uh, then it will do the math for you. And then as you can see, of course, I closed down uh, the add systems box, but it will give you, to start with, it will give you mm -hmm. the estimated storage cost. And it will, as I mentioned, based on the two pools that we've decided uh, or de 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 um, assigned for West Europe and North Europe, it will say, hey, you know, your best guess or your best sizing for the production environment would be a single premium pool of 90 terabytes, nice, which, yeah. will, which will cost you this. Uh, and it, the sizing is based on the capacity. So you need it, you need premium for capacity purposes. Um, so you don't uh, you don't oversize based on performance. Actually, there is a 260 terabyte, sorry, 260 megabyte per second access performance, which you can freely use for let's say you know end of month uh, burst. You know, you, you need to do an end of month uh, you know calculation. Uh, you can assign that uh, you know dynamically to uh, to your production, and you can up your performance uh, for that reason, right? So uh, that that would be one. Another would be you know you can you can pick standard. Um, but then you need, in order to meet the performance requirements, you actually need a lot of capacity, 344 yeah. terabytes, uh, which of course is a, therefore a performance-based sizing, uh, but it's more expensive, right? So even though standard is cheaper, premium is relatively more expensive. Ah, cool. the, yeah. out, the outcome is still that premium is uh, cheaper. And in this case, Ultra, which a lot of people think that they require, is actually not required and is more expensive. So that's mm -hmm. not the most optimal uh, scenario in this case. Lastly, uh, from a from a storage cost perspective, the primary storage, the DR site is of course built on cross-region replication, and you can replicate from premium to standard. Because in the DR scenario, typically you don't use the storage for any production workload, and you want to you want the cheapest option, which is standard. And then as you go through a DR uh, case, 
then obviously you can change your performance levels or your service levels uh, to, to premium and basically up your performance um, uh, on yeah, the fly and, and only pay what you need when you need. So that's that. Um, lastly, then backup, right? It does include ANF backup where uh, snapshots are vaulted. Uh, and it does calculate based on the you know all the parameters that were put in, and I don't know exactly what was oops what was entered here out offhand, but it says uh, there's a 30% change rate on the production and 10% on the different ones. Um, there is a 1% change rate on the shared. We keep five snap uh, snapshots uh, uh, per day of uh, five days of snapshots, and we keep 30 days of uh, backup in uh, for prod pre prod and QS and the rest we don't keep backups, right? So based on that, it will give you uh, the amount of capacity you need and what your uh, monthly storage uh, capacity oh. and your storage cost would be. Mm -hmm. And then, oops, wrong button. And then it will give you also uh, the capacity pool summary, right? You basically, in this case, it's fairly simple. You need two only, two pools. Uh, you have additional space for snapshots, right? So you can actually store more snapshots because of uh, some capacity that you have left. Um, and it will also give you the full volume layout, right? That you need, nice. right? So it can give you basically the all you need to say now. Let's use my application volume group for Hana for SP Hana. I enter that input, and it will you know one click start deploying all of that, and uh, off you go. Perfect. Well, I think that's, that's a lot of cal helpful. calculation. I mean, that's uh, that would be a huge help. That is a huge help for the new and and customers and existing one as well because they would eventually add some new stuff there yes and there's a plan also to um to allow you to take the um you know the uh, the uh, the uh, the actual base sizing outputs and import that into the tool as well right so so if you have already done the you know sizing in the in, in the sizing calculator that you have that you guys have then we can take that input and just basically work this in and, and actually give you a an accurate, uh, you know, SAP uh, ANF uh, based sizing as well. Cool. Cool. Yeah, that makes sense. We don't have it yet, but that's kind of on the horizon uh, from from what we want to add. And as I mentioned, I can export this uh, file configuration. You get a JSON file and you can pass it around. You can you know, put it in your in your design documents and you know as you as you go through your uh, you know your your design exercises, architectural reviews, you can resize again and and again and again, right? So by importing or even sharing uh, a URL, and you, you can go. Uh, oh, nice! Through. Yeah. Cool. So okay, cool. So now we know that. how to size our um azure netup file storage but now if we we switch over to oracle um if we look at large oracle deployments and um, sometime back we, we had a nice session about a migration with i think it was 100 terabytes um on oracle to to azure so so we, we definitely have these very very large instances what can you tell us about those yeah so uh... And I'm going to move this tab a little bit to the right. Oops, sorry, I moved it out now. This to the right because I'm going to get back to the sizing again. Mm -hmm. um, but as we, um, as as you recall, or the ones that were on the podcast before, uh, we we had the session around, um, let's say, Oracle Exa data based uh, workload migrations, uh, right? Because what we do see in the world is um, a, a lot of the the large scale deployments out there for Oracle and whether or not they're SAP irrespective, a lot of them are actually hosted on Exadata, right? And Exadata, of course, being an engineered system, is not something that you can that you can lift into Azure, right? So you, so you need to lift uh, or migrate your workload. Uh, and we we went through this uh, you know this article back then. Um, and I want to quickly highlight a few things. I don't want to go through the article again all over, but one of the most important things I do want to highlight is the following table. Um, and that is that if you look at Azure Virtual Machine uh, SKUs and the, the relative disk uh, throughput limitations of those SKUs versus the network uh, bandwidth limitations, is that you'll, what you'll see is that uh, you, know, you, you get a lot more bandwidth, network bandwidth for the buck than that you get uh, disk I.O. for the buck, right? Mm -hmm. so, so what that means effectively is that if you have a, a, a heavy storage intensive workload that needs a lot of throughput, that, that means that you, you, need, you, know, you need a lot of bandwidth. And if your disk bandwidth is limited, um, you you kind of have to end up at the higher end of the the, the VM skew spectrum 
to host a, a workload. And maybe you don't need that even from an uh, from a CPU or memory perspective, but just because of the disk bandwidth limitation, you kind of need to go up the rank, right? And with network storage, which Azure Net of Files is based on NFS, uh, of course, you have a lot more uh, flexibility, right? So I, I imagine if you have a, a workload that needs two gigabytes per second throughput, right? Then you see that you, you, there's no virtual machine that can actually handle that in this table uh, based on the max disk and uh, throughput, um, only based on burst, but that's very uh, unpredictable, right? Because unpredictable because if, if you run out of burst, then obviously you run out of throughput and that causes pain on your on your workload. With Azure Net Files, you, you, can, you can already get that with an E32 uh, SKU type uh, with eight constraint cores. Right, so if you, if your workload doesn't need more than eight cores and it only needs uh, you know let's say two uh, two hundred fifty six max of memory, um, you know uh, sorry gigs of memory, then then why would you go all the way up to to the E sixty four or even higher uh, if you can do it with an E thirty two? Uh, eight constraint cores, which is what Azure Net Files allows you to do, right? So that's mm -hmm. what I really wanted to to highlight. Now, then there is one important. I would say misunderstanding out there, and that is the uh, let's say perceived performance limitation of Azure Net of Files. So if I were to ask you guys, what do you think what the performance, you know, the, the maximum performance of Azure Net of Files is, then what would you say? Honestly, I don't I don't know. It's yeah, as you were mentioning, depends also on the capacity pool, but that's just uh, on the net up side, it's also depends on the VM throughput limit, which is dependent on the VM yeah. scale, right? If you forget about the net, uh, if we forget about the virtual machine, I mean, every virtual, every volume on Azure Net of Files, you know, an, an Azure Net of Files volume has a throughput maximum, right? If you go to the Azure Net of Files documentation pages, you'll find that the maximum throughput, throughput of an Azure Net of Files volume, when it's a regular volume, uh, we forget about it, the large volumes for a second because we also have a large volumes, but that's not uh, suitable for databases. But for regular volumes, the maximum throughput is four and a half gigabytes per second, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what a lot of people think that that is the limitation of Azure Net of Files. That is, of course, not true because that's the limitation of a single volume for Azure Net of Files. However, if you're smart about it, like with disks, you would add multiple disks to get more throughput. You can also add more volumes to get more throughput, right? So if you add multiple Azure Net of Files volumes, then obviously you can reach a lot higher throughput than that four and a half gigabytes per second. Now, what's interesting in, uh, let's say, on the back of this discussion back in October, we've done some benchmarking um, for multiple volume layouts. And that was actually driven by a large customer uh, in Australia that uh, happened to require and hold your uh, seats. That happened to require a rough 16 gigabytes per second throughput mm -hmm. for their Oracle workload on a single host with a mixed 50-50% read-write ratio. Right, so 16 gigabytes per second throughput. In total, they needed about 30 gigabytes for their uh, multi-host system uh, of throughput. Now, that was a puzzle, of course, that we wanted to solve. So that's what we did, right? So if you look at this um, this uh, this article uh, that talks about the uh, performance benchmark using Azure Net of Files multiple volumes, it talks about enterprise uh, scale up and scale out, meaning scale up in a single host configuration and scale out in a multi host configuration. But we've, before we went to the scale out, we obviously wanted to show and demonstrate the maximum of a single um, a virtual machine. Now, we picked the biggest virtual machine right out there with the most uh, bandwidth uh, available to us at the moment, and that was the E104. Right, so the E104 has a um, de documented 100 gigabytes per second egress limit, which is, translates roughly to 12 and a half gigabytes per second throughput on on writes. Right, so they can they can achieve that. It happens that all virtual machines have a, have a, are not very limited on reads. So read uh, lim read read uh, let's say limitation is typically the same on all virtual machines, and that's also 100 gigabytes per second. But writes is important because we have this 50 50 percent uh, write workload. Right. So what we did is okay. Now let's let's scale that performance, right? So what do we need to do for that? And, and that is the following. So we need to deploy 
based on the sizing that we needed, multiple Azure Net Files data volumes, right? And based on the sizing, we determined that we would need five data volumes for this purpose. And we needed, of course, or uh, uh, log and RDAF uh, volumes as well, right? So that is the typical that we need. So in total, we needed eight volumes. And not only did we need eight volumes, we also wanted to make sure that each of those volumes would have maximum network storage bandwidth to the network. So we created uh, volumes with individual storage endpoints for each volume, right? So we didn't share any, any storage endpoint. Uh, each volume would have their own storage endpoint and therefore their own IP address and basically their own mount point on a separate IP address, right? So that gives us maximum distribution across those volumes, right? Now with that, we ran a uh, slot benchmarks, right? And with that, we could demonstrate easily that we could reach about 800,000 IOs per second with a rough maximum of a 0.5 milliseconds of latency, mm -hmm. right? So that was, let's say that was a good starting point, right, for uh, for this type of workload. And this was mostly uh, 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 heavily, read, uh, heavily read workloads. That translates into if we, add sufficient slope threads to a throughput of over 10 gigabytes per second on pure read, mostly mm -hmm. read, right? Now, since uh, read writes, uh, since the workload was read write, and uh, you, you can multiplex reads and write on the same uh, on the same channel, of course, we can distribute that uh, uh, and, and push it even further because effectively you get 10 gigabytes per second read throughput, 10 gigabytes per second write throughput, so total 20. So we can balance that and reach the 15 uh, the 15 gigabytes per second uh, read write ratio that they needed, right? So, but this is what we want to demonstrate. So basically, what we can do, we can with Azure Net Files basically hit the limit of a virtual machine on throughput. Mm -hmm. So as long as your virtual machine you know, gets bigger, if you guys make virtual machines with bigger network, Azure Boost comes to mind, you know, then obviously uh, those level of throughputs can be uh, popped cool. up even further, right? Yeah, yeah. Cool, yeah. So that's that. And then of course, also we said, okay, let's do this multi-architecture, right? So this customer actually had three hosts uh, in their uh, in their setup. So it was a three host architecture and said, let's let's scale this horizontally and see how far we can reach that, push that for three hosts, right? And we did the same. Um, and it basically turned out to be, uh, to give us two and a half million IOs at uh, 0.6 milliseconds <laughs> latency, uh, which translates right. to, uh, let's say rough 30 gigabytes per second of total uh, who, total throughput. I wonder who needs that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's impressive. It is impressive, but yeah, probably, uh, yeah, there are sometimes customer who are, Doing select star from the universe, you know. Queries. There is, um, <laughs> you know, there is, there is. Uh, how would I say, um, retail customers that have, uh, let's say, a high peak seasonality. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> and yeah, yeah. High peak seasonality, then you'll see this type of, uh, you know, these type yeah, of uh, yeah. environments. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. And this yeah. is not unique. I mean, obviously, I mean, this is. I would say 30 gigabytes per second is on the high end of the spectrum, right? I mean, I'm not going to say that every mom's and pop shop is that would have this level, but there's certainly a lot of customers that need, you know, six gigabytes per second throughput, seven. I mean, Exadata workloads are easily like that, especially the production workloads. Uh, and basically what this demonstrates is, you know, there is no reason to shy away from those, right? Mm -hmm, why, mm -hmm. why not host them on Azure? We can just easily handle them. Um, so that's good. One last point to make is, I mean, there's a lot of content in this book and people that are really interested to, to yeah. really go through this. Uh, but one thing I want, one point that I wanted to make is that, of course, we're using direct NFS, right? So if you go to these connections here on the on the diagram, then all of these are, um, you know, direct NFS uh, mounts, right? Using Oracle direct NFS, because that gives you the maximum concurrency. Um, I would say, don't ever, never, ever consider using regular kernel NFS always use direct NFS uh, within your Oracle setup. Um, but uh, when you use multiple volumes like this, there's also potentially some, let's say some uh, uh, management you want to do across those volumes. And that's where, if you go down here uh, in, in this uh, article, that's where um, uh, ASM, you know, uh, Oracle uh, Automatic Storage Management comes in, right? So what you can do with direct NFS and uh, these disk groups uh, or let's say direct NFS and ASM is create these disk groups where 
Oracle can then allow you to, you know, load, load balance, stripe, etc. You can add volumes, rebalance, and so on. So yeah. there's a lot of flexibility in terms of, uh, you know, growth or capacity changes or mm -hmm. uh, performance and throughput changes, and uh, and have that, uh, you know, uh, properly managed. Okay, that's interesting to use ASM also on uh, NF. Yeah, actually, you get more, yeah, yeah, easier to manage it. Yeah, okay, more so. I mean, obviously, I mean, you guys are uh, familiar with HANA, right? The HANA deployments with Azure Net Files, we would recommend or actually urge everyone to use application volume group for SAP HANA. I would say stay tuned, uh, you know, in this Oracle space. Uh, uh, but there's news uh, down, you know, down the line as well on that. But if you want to, let's say if you have a customer that, or if you are a customer that want to deploy these type of landscapes, make sure to reach out to us because we can, uh, we can uh, already help you. Uh, and then circling back to the sizer, we can also use the sizer tool here uh, using the, uh, you know, the instead of the add HANA system, add single volume parameters, uh, size Oracle setups as well already, mm -hmm. while we work on additional tools for Oracle sizing. So this is another example where the sizing tool kind of comes in handy uh, because it, it's not limited to HANA only uh, mm -hmm, for, mm -hmm. uh, for this purpose. Right. So, I mean, uh, I think we're already, uh, you know, I talked for, I don't know how long, but uh, I didn't even allow you to guys to ask questions. So let's, uh, let's hear it. I think I, I'm just impressed, honestly. Uh, I, I didn't know that you can really scale up that high um, with Azure NetApp files and, and uh, the appropriate Azure virtual machines. And it's, it's really amazing that, yeah, I, I can definitely imagine that customers in the retail industry that they need this extremely high load from from time to time certainly not always so yeah. it's, it's it's good to see that we can actually really address these topics on azure yeah yeah the good news is i mean you, the, 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 coming back to the question that i asked you guys so what is the the limitation of for azure Netflix files throughput limitation the answer is actually it's unlimited for as long as you have sufficient azure Netflix files resources in the region uh, so as long as there's re, uh, you know ANF uh, resources available, uh, you know then then we can we can uh, deploy these type of landscapes. Uh, you know theoretically you could go as wild as uh, you know 10, 10, 10 host systems and go up to I don't know how far. But obviously that requires you know sufficient virtual machines, sufficient yeah, Azure cloud resources, and so yeah. on. Um, but yeah, I mean, let's say we we wouldn't shy away from these type of deployments. But of course, this is not uh, something for the smallest Azure regions. This is really something for uh, you know for the the real regions that customers uh, uh, yeah. uh, use. But yeah, um, that's that's basically the answer to the question. Perfect. Well, Gert, thank you so much for for this extensive update. First of all, in general, the update on ANF. But then really also um, explaining or talking about this very nice um, scenario and and as you said not not just a theoretical scenario but really something that you uh, work with with a customer already so so really cool yes also uh, we're planning on releasing um, a couple of videos uh, on the sizing tool right so instructional okay. videos like how to how to use the like uh, you know including all kinds of scenarios and explanation of in depth uh, so uh, we're also planning on a blog post uh, on the same um, so expect uh, additional information coming uh, coming down the pike shortly as well to really help uh, you know the, the field at large but also of course customers to really get going with uh, with all of this perfect nice cool, I love you guys. thank you so much for joining us today um uh, yeah we will see you again i'm sure about that uh, there is more some... news coming i would say let's uh you know schedule another one in half a year or so uh, yeah. I, i'm more than happy to join uh, there's there's we'll more there's a lot more goodness coming perfect cool thank you so much everyone and then we'll talk again in half a year <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you for you. having me uh over gorn it was a good talk thank, thank you. you thank you yeah. thank you